besides this. We've never no, discussed that topic. I just okay, assumed, that's fine. given that his name was Kurt. That's fine. Was okay, hi. Good. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, just a bit of an addendum to the last uh, topic, uh, people. We were talking about the old gift, uh, uh, the gift loan issue from parents to kids. For those of you who are interested in this area, um, Howard Feldman, who's a, a sole practitioner in Toronto, did a wonderful paper about a year and a half ago. I can't remember if it's a law society or CBAO program. I apologize if I'm advertising for the competition. But it was a wonderful paper and uh, on that very topic. Uh, it was all about all the cases dealing with uh, the loan gift issue. Um, and I'm sure you can probably find it. And if you can't, contact Howard. And I think he has a website. I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, send you a copy of it. Um, just be a little careful though, his paper was written before the recent amendments to the Limitation Act, so be cautious with uh, some of the uh, limitation some of the limitation issues. All right, we're moving on. Our, uh, next, uh, our next topic is uh, notional disposition costs, and for this we have Alf Mamo in London and Steve Renat in, uh, here live in Toronto, both of whom are uh, probably very well known to both of you from uh, their frequent appearance at continuing education programs and uh, uh, their appearance in many uh, reported cases. Um, I find that the quickest way that I can get a bit of a sense as to um, the quality of the opposition in a case where there's a new family lawyer on the other side that I've never met is to take a look, very quick look at the client's uh, other side's financial statement. And you can learn a lot very quickly simply looking at uh, what uh, disposition costs or notional disposition costs are uh, picked, picked up. Um, and uh, it's the difference between people who give the financial statement to the client and rely on the client's knowledge as opposed to people who are looking uh, perhaps a little bit more aggressively to find all of these adjustments to NFP. Anyways, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Alf Mamo. Alf, are you there in London? I am here, semi-comatose. You're live, I'm almost. Great. Okay, Alf, I'm, <laughs> Alf, I'm assuming you're going first? <laughs> Yes, I am. Okay, um, and we're going to stop you roughly halfway through? Yes, uh, okay. I'll speak for about 10 minutes, Lauren, and then uh, Steve will speak after that and we'll take questions. Great, I can't kick you from there, so uh, hopefully whoever is uh, sitting next to uh, Alf can set their watch right now, and when it hits 10 minutes, give them a kick in the pants. <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, the topic that, to continue our uh, theme uh, on uh, splitting the pie, we're going to hear from Alf and uh, Steve on terms of uh, how you cr uh, trim the crust off uh, of the pie uh, before, it's, uh, before it's shared. Alf? Thanks, Lauren. Um, in spite of the fact that uh, Sangmuller was decided nine years ago in 1994, and we all thought that once the case came down, we're all going to know what to do about... Uh, disposition costs, there's still a lot of confusion. Some of the air has been cleared, but by and large, it's an area that continues to be very confused. And the reason for that is very simple. The reason is because the Court of Appeal, as uh, many appellate courts have done, and as Miglin did just uh, 10 days ago in the Supreme Court of Canada, is that the guidance that they give us is when you come to a fork in the road, take it. So. As a result of that, we're still not quite sure what it is that we're supposed to do. And what I hope we can try to do today, Robert's got an excellent breakdown of the cases, is not for me to look at the individual cases, but to in fact look at, is there some principled approach that we can take to assist us in, in uh, looking at the disposition costs? And I'd like to propose a number of different principles that you might want to look at. Number one. Remember, remember the, the preamble of the Family Law Act. Remember in law school when they say, well, well, you can't find a section. Well, go back to the purpose of the legislation and make an argument. I always say this is remedial legislation and therefore it's intended to correct all of the ills of the world. And by doing that, you look at the preamble. The preamble says that marriage is like a partnership 
And when that partnership dissolves, then we're supposed to look at an orderly and equitable way of dividing up the partnership assets. So keep that in mind, that when you're looking at cost of disposition, we're really looking at the value of assets, and underlying that is what's, a, what's the equitable, orderly way of dividing that asset. Use that as a test, always make that as an argument to support your position when it comes to arguing in court. Secondly, and this follows at the heels of that, have a theory of why your argument with respect to how much of the cost of disposition should or should not be taken into consideration. Non, don't simply say it's because it's fair or because it seems like a good idea or even just because it's equitable, but have a theory of the case. The theory of the case could be driven by the nature of the asset. It could be driven by the reason why the asset exists. For example, an RRSP, why did the asset exist? Because the couple thought that they're going to have this money for them to save later on. Does it make sense then when you split it up that it's discounted by 40%? Someone takes cash, the other person hangs on to that asset that continues to accumulate tax-free until the age of 69. And you can make an argument built around that. You might want to make a constructive trust argument to say, that's the purpose behind this asset, and as such, let's try to look at the cost of this position being uh, equitable in terms of dividing the asset itself. And I'll, I'll deal with that uh, briefly in a moment as well. Another principle to remember is this. There are actually two types of assets that we usually look at when trying to figure out what are the costs of disposition. The first type of asset is an asset that you can use and enjoy without disposing of it. This, for example, would be a house, an apartment building as an investment, or indeed a business, where you can use it, you can enjoy it, you can even get money from it without having to dispose of it. The issue is, what's the value of that asset? What kind of disposition costs if it were to be disposed of? And is it only going to be deducted if it is disposed of? And those, there's case laws surrounding that, and it's important to note the nature of that asset. The second type of asset that we look at is an asset that cannot be used or enjoyed unless it is transformed into something else. A pension and an RRSP would be examples of this type of asset. In other words, you can have the biggest pension in the world, it's not going to do you any good until you qualify to receive it and you turn it into money. The same with an RRSP, turning into a RIF or, turning, or cashing it in. With those second type of assets, usually the argument simply is, what are the costs, what are the usually the income tax ramifications of doing that, and what kind of number should we use, what kind of percentage to arrive in that amount? With the first type of asset that you can still use and enjoy without disposing of it, usually the argument is around, number one, is it going to be disposed of, so are there going to be disposition costs triggered? And secondly, if so, what are they going to be? Now. The fact that, some, that an asset is not going to be sold doesn't necessarily mean that you don't trigger any disposition costs. Certainly, there are a lot of assets that inherent in their value, they have certain liabilities, usually income tax liabilities. One can argue, for example, that every house has inherent in it a real estate commission value. In other words, the way we look at the value of houses contains in it a built-up um, a build-in amount knowing that when it's sold in 98% of the cases, there's going to be a real estate commission attached to it. So that one should take that into consideration whether the house is going to be sold or not. The next aspect of this that I want you to, to, to address your mind to is what what is it that drives the notion of disposition costs? And what drives it is risk management. What we really are saying is when you've got an asset that might or might not be sold and that when it is disposed of or transferred into some other fashion, it's going to attract tax or it's going to attract uh, disposition costs of some sort, then you're saying, let's manage the risk. 
let's make sure that we don't value it at $200,000 today for NFP purposes, and then a year from now, when someone sells it and there's capital gains tax, and et cetera, they will only get $50,000 out of it. So it's really risk management. So that one way of trying to reduce uh, the risk, one way of, of spreading the risk around, is to actually look at the division of the asset in species. If it's a federal pension, then you might want to make sure that you divide it according to the Pension Act, Pension Benefits Act, which you could do a lot easier in federal pensions than you can uh, because of lack of legislation uh, in Ontario. Our RSPs, obviously, under Section 146.16 of the Income Tax Act, can be divided in species. But having said that, I want you to remember there are different factors that you should consider in looking at the discount. Even though you might divide the RSPs equally, they are not equal if one person is 65 years old and is about to turn that into a RIF within four years or so, and if that woman has married a younger man who is only 25 years old, and it's going to take a long time before that person is going to get their money out. So again, go back to a principled approach and say, what are we trying to do? What is equitable? What is the nature of the, of the asset that we're looking at, and how can we make sure that the risk is fairly divided. With RRSPs, for example, you're not going to discount it by 45% if the couple is 40 years old, because they're not going to cash it in. They're not going to, uh, unless the facts dictate otherwise, of course. But the, the chances are, by the time they're 69, you'd look at the present day value of that tax, and it's not going to be 40%. So take a look at the facts, and again, go back to what Robert has said and, and, and Pat Schmidt, evidence is key. Don't simply accept a proposition without looking at a principled approach, look behind it, look at the evidence. What is the ages of the parties? How does that impact on it? The health of the parties. Health impacts greatly on issues such as pension, for example. What are the kind of tax benefits or what are some of the tax problems that might exist within a company that will dictate uh, what, what the eventual cost will be of, of uh, disposing of that asset or even continue to operate it. So you need to have a theory behind the dis cost of disposition. You need to have the facts on which to anchor those, that, that theory and need to find a solution that will let you argue that this argument should be accepted because it's more in keeping with what the legislation requests of you than an, an article or a, a proposition made by somebody else. So my message is don't be afraid to look at the different factors, be analytical. Someone once said that if you tell somebody that there's 300 billion stars in the sky, they'll accept it blindly. But if you tell them don't sit on that bench because it's wet, they'll touch it. Now, what I'm saying to you is don't accept blindly any report that's made by some actuary or made by business evaluators simply because it comes from an expert. What I'm asking you to do is touch it. Look at the facts behind it. Look at what kind of discount they're using. Look at the factors in terms of age. Look at the factors in terms of the tax. You don't have to become an expert, but you should be mindful of knowing when you're explaining it to your client, why you're asking your client to do one thing instead of the other. Don't simply say because the expert says so. So I think my time is up, Lauren. I'm going to stop there and uh, then have Steve uh, take it from there to deal with specific ca calculations really re dealing with uh, these various issues. Thank you very much, Alf. Um, I've often been told that uh, when speaking, uh, if your audience can take away 10 good points from your presentation, you've done your job. Uh, everyone has done such an excellent job before me. Your heads are probably spinning. So if you can take three things out of my presentation, I'll be quite happy. Um, the uh, program coordinator, sorry, Andrew is going to be my beautiful assistant today, scrolling down. Uh, the uh, program coordinator asked me if I could include a, a chart uh, with my presentation, uh, but she also said, uh, don't put too many numbers into it. So here's my non-numerical chart. Um, well, 
most people don't like to think about uh, future disposition costs. They're not pleasant. They're so many years away. Uh, they like to fill their minds with happy thoughts instead. Uh, your job as uh, matrimonial lawyers is to reprogram your client, to make them understand that now is the only time in their lives where disposition costs become good things, and let's look for them. There are uh, two types of notional disposition costs, or two most common, and we break them into the categories of non-tax and tax. If all we were going to talk about was non-tax, this would be an extremely short presentation, so most of it will deal with the tax issues. The non-tax liabilities, primarily, nothing that surprises anyone. These are commission or selling costs on uh, assets that are held, commission and legal fees on real property, which uh, Robert had discussed in uh, his presentation. Uh, we're all aware there's selling costs on portfolio investments. Uh, we may or may not be aware that when selling a business, there could be, in addition to the contingent income tax costs, also the cost of paying a broker to sell that business and other selling costs, say, on collectibles. Not only assets have disposition costs. There can also be cancellation penalties on debts or, say, a lease. So keep those in mind if your client has those types of liabilities that may also have additional liabilities attached there, too. Let's get into the meat now, the tax on the sale of a business. And we'll start with an incorporated business. Somebody has a valuable business one might automatically assume there must be a tax liability attached to it. Well, there may or may not be. And if you're acting for the non-title spouse, it may be in your best interest to have your business valuator review the other side's calculations, however reasonable they may appear to you. Because if a prudent taxpayer arranges his affairs properly, a valuable business can have zero tax liability attached to it. The most common example would be if that person could use the capital gains exemption. And we all remember the capital gains exemption got wiped out years and years ago. However, it still remains for certain types of property, most commonly for small business corporations and also qualified farm property. So have your evaluator take a look at this and see if they meet the definition of a qualified small business corporation, there's a good chance that tax will be minimized. There's also issues such as whether the shareholder, him or herself, has restrictions, something known as a cumulative net investment loss account can restrict someone's ability to use the exemption. However, this is not the most common thing. Also, take a look to see old tax returns. If the title spouse has ever claimed um, a bump up in his or her adjusted cost base, it may indicate that a tax calculation at V-Day could be inappropriate. Now, I've included on this um, overhead here the capital gains inclusion rates, which you'll memorize. And they start at 0% before 1972 and bounce up and down between 50%, two-thirds, 75%, back down to the 50% of today over the last 30 years or so. What other ways are there to defer capital gains? You sell a property and take back a mortgage, there's a capital gains deferral there. You have stock options that have accrued benefits of them. Well, the last few federal and provincial budgets were nice enough to give us deferrals and also additional exemptions on these types of gains. So let's watch out for those. And lastly, here's an issue. You can also create a capital loss on the sale of a business that's valuable if the business is taxed on a wind-up. So keep that in mind. There could be a contingent asset right beside that contingent liability. Let's go to the unincorporated business. The unincorporated business, in general, is simpler to calculate the tax on. In most cases, it's a, let's say it's a professional practice, there's only one real asset that has an accrued gain on it, and that's the goodwill. And goodwill is taxed at rates similar to capital gains, although not exactly. Go back to the 1994 tax return of that uh, spouse and take a look to see if he or she made a capital gains exemption to bump up the cost base on that goodwill also. Another type of disposition cost is if V-Day is before 2004 and the unincorporated business existed in 1995, the selling of that business or winding it up may also cause the title spouse to lose their stub period reserve and cause additional taxes to come into income right away. So that increases disposition costs. 
Rarely are there other significant costs. However, when we're talking about unincorporated businesses, let's not forget about limited partnership interests, the disposition of which or the wind-up of which usually leads to significant income taxes. Incorporated businesses we talked about, you can wind up or you can sell by selling the shares. You can also cause the corporation to sell its assets and wind up itself. And this is where business valuators have the opportunity to sound really smart because we'll talk about internal taxes, some taxed at capital gains rates, some taxed at regular income rates. We'll talk about the income taxes, some that all go to Revenue Canada, some that are refundable and are paid back in a few years depending on how the money is distributed from the corporation. It, it's done intentionally to confuse everybody except for the accountants. And lastly, when you look at these assets inside the company, remember we talked about the pre-1972 assets? Some that have capital gains, you got the same issue inside the company. Inside a company or held personally can be real property. And real property has two types of taxes normally attached to it. One is the capital gain on appreciation. And even if the property doesn't appreciate, if it's been held a long time, there is likely a significant liability for recaptured depreciation. And though, once again, those are taxed at different rates. However, we have the principal residence, which everyone says automatically, no tax. But be careful. If a couple has a city home and had a year or two before V-Day sold an expensive cottage, they may have used their principal residence designation on that cottage, in which case the accrued gain or most of the accrued gain on that city home is still taxable. Other assets that are held personally, let's talk about retirement savings plans. RRSPs, the rule is you don't have to take anything out till age 69. And in many cases, we adopt that approach when calculating the future tax on it. And we assume it won't be taxed until starting at age 69. RIFs, RIFs are the continuation of RRSPs. So if your client already has a RIF, they're being taxed on it right away, in which case the present value adjustment won't be nearly as significant. And an employer pension plan, well, that's not as flexible as an RRSP or a RIF. So it may not be at your client's discretion as to when that one is taxed. When do we present value the liabilities to? Well, with a business interest, the most common question should be, when do you plan on selling the business or when do you plan on retiring? With investments, chances are your client might say to you, I plan on liquidating them right away. But you may want to look at that client's history of how long he or she holds their investments as a better indication of what's right. RRSPs, what well, we said, you don't have to pay tax on them until after uh, you turn age 69. So it might be reasonable to take a midpoint between age 69 and life expectancy. What tax rate do you use? Well, I wish it was simple and I could tell you in this situation it's always the marginal tax rate and in this situation it's always the average tax rate. But these decisions depend on the type of income and the expected timing of the income. At this point, I think I've left time for questions. And I've also run out of slides. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we're now going to take questions on our virtual tour. Uh, Barry, do you have any questions? No, oh, thank you. Branford, do you have any questions? Hamilton, do you have any questions? Uh, for that time period, how much did they reduce? Because uh, usually the valuation, they don't explain it very well, <laughs> like in a figure. Kenora, do you have any questions? Realistically, uh... <laughs> Kingston, do you have any questions? Kirkland Lake, do you have any questions? Starting point, this is a lake to dispose of the asset. London. Niagara on the lake, do you have any questions? North Bay, do you have any questions? Ottawa, any questions? Peterborough, any questions? Sault Ste. Marie, any questions? Yes, a very quick question. Uh, pension valuations, oftentimes uh, valuators don't give a lot of explanations for the income tax liability that they uh, arrive at. And I heard some comments today, especially if someone is quite some time away from a pension as to an appropriate discount rate. If uh, it is uh, estimated that there will be significant other income 
um, after age 65 uh, and somebody is 20 years away from pension, is, is there some sort of guideline as to what uh, the reduction would be from what would normally expect uh, the tax rate to be, for example, a after age 65, if you expect the pension to be taxed at about 40 percent, but it's 20 years away, what, what rate would you use in, in that situation? I get the impression you're asking two questions here, so correct me if I'm wrong. I think your first question is, if the individual is expect to have significantly higher income on retirement, should you use the tax rate associated with that higher income to calculate the uh, contingent tax on the pension, or should you use their current tax rate? Is that your first question? Sure. Okay. <laughs> As evaluators, we're not going to make a legal judgment on which is the appropriate tax rate. And there could be legal arguments both ways as to which rate should be used. However, given the information, let's say a person is expected to inherit a fortune, in which case they'll be taxed at the highest marginal rate and their average rate will be so close to 46 percent, it's just simplest to use it. That would be the rate that we would value uh, the contingent tax thereon. Now, one party's lawyer may wish to argue it's not fair because the asset attached to that higher income stream on retirement hasn't been included in NFP. But if you're saying to me what rate should be used without making a legal argument, I'm being told that person's going to be taxed at 46 percent on retirement, I would calculate the income stream as having been taxed at that rate. Now the second question has to do with the present valuing. Present valuing, you've said, is about 20 years away. We normally present value for the period, so let's say the person starts an income stream at age 65, 20 years from now, and their life expectancy is 80, we would say, on average, that income stream will be taxed at uh, that person's age 72, so they're 27 years away. We would present value for 27 years at an after-tax <laughs> discount rate because we would value the pension income stream based on what it's worth in after-tax dollars. Uh, Sudbury, do you have any questions? <laughs> Thunder Bay, any questions? Waterloo? Uh, yes, I have a question. Go ahead. You have a very good explanation of tax. Well, I've, a couple times I've called the place, though. Is that I've me you're them. waiting for? Yes, we're waiting for your question. And that's it. Not that we press okay. the value. Um, I have a question about how the uh, discount rate works on uh, uh, retirement savings accounts, and I'm looking at page 4-3 of the uh, materials. Um, you're talking about a, a 50-year-old female uh, and applying a, a discount rate of 3% that you bring the value of the tax down to 12%. Can you explain the math to me in that, please? Okay. The 3% and the 12% we're talking about here are two different things. So often we see someone uh, on a 69K or a Form 13 indicate the, pres uh, the, uh, the income tax is relating to an RSP at, say, a flat 50 percent, a flat 46 percent, a flat 25 percent even, without giving thought to the age of the annuitant here. And what we're saying is, unless the person's a high-income earner, expected to remain a high-income earner on retirement, and in fact very close to retirement, you should seldom have numbers over 40 percent as the contingent tax on a retirement savings plan. As an example, we give here a 50-year-old female whose life expectancy um, actuarially is 83 years. Uh, on average, she's 26 years away from withdrawing her money. So when you calculate her discount rate, and I remember what I said, I use an after-tax discount rate. So if the long-term bond rate is 6%, the after-tax rate is closer to 3%. In which case, the present value of the average tax rate falls to about 12 percent because let's say we said on average uh, she'll be taxed at 30 percent in the future, or I think I said here 25 percent. When you present value that for 20-something years at 3 percent, it halves that tax rate. So it drops from 25 down to 12 percent. Don't be surprised, but that is mathematically the more appropriate contingent tax rate on RSPs, and you should see it more and more often as people become better educated as to present valuing of tax liabilities on RSPs. 
Okay, my, my question was, uh, how do you get from uh, the 25% down to the 12%? Is it easy oh. to explain how the yeah, math works? Yeah, sorry about that, I skipped a step here. Uh, if I start at 25% and then I say I'm 26 years away at 3%, if I do uh, 3% to the exponent of 26, it's going to be about half which means that instead of taking 25%, I'm only going to take half of 25% as the present value. That gets me down to 12%. Yeah, or 3% to the exponent of 20. So discounting at 3% yeah. for 26 years gets you down to half. That's where the actuary is. Any questions in Waterloo? Windsor? Toronto? Do we have any questions in the audience? I have a question. Uh, just quickly, uh, Steve has told us how we calculate these contingent taxes, but what I'd like him to now do briefly is tell us how to value them. We calculate the tax and then we discount them using a present value discount rate. And there are numerous factors that go into the selection of that discount rate, which directly and dramatically in some cases affects the value of the debt and I'd like Steve to review some of the factors that go into the selection of that discount rate. In most cases when we value a contingent tax liability, well that tax is a certainty. And if the tax is a certainty or if any liability is a certainty, then we use the risk-free rate. And the risk-free rate most easily quantified you look at a, law, at a Government of Canada bond rate. We like to believe in this country that any money that our government owes is virtually guaranteed and God willing it stays that way. So we use that as a measure of the risk-free rate. So as an example, if the long-term bond rate is 6%, we use the after-tax rate of about 3%. The reason we use an after-tax rate is the question, how much money does the title spouse have to put away now so it would grow to the amount that's expected to be owed when the tax has to be paid. And since any money put away now to be grown would be taxed, it's more appropriate to use an after-tax rate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alf and Steve. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Martha McCarthy. Uh, who is going to be talking to us about property remedies for unmarried partners in the wake of Walsh and Bona. The last uh, 10 years in family law uh, has seen the topic of the rights and obligations of common law and same-sex spouses become the uh, uh, predominant issue. And in each of the uh, cases that have uh, uh, captured both public and uh, family law lawyers' attention, over that period of time, uh, Martha has been uh, very much at the uh, forefront in uh, defining uh, what the law is. Uh, many of us thought that the Supreme Court of Canada, when given the opportunity in Walsh and Bona, would uh, basically wipe out the distinction between uh, common law same-sex spouses on one hand and married spouses. Maybe I was the only person who thought that, that was they were going to do, but uh, at least I was surprised and I thought Martha would have to find something else to do for a living. But uh, as a result of their decision, I think this is a bit, continues to be a lively and live issue in family law, and I think no one is uh, better qualified than Martha to uh, talk to us today about where the law is and, and more importantly, where it's going. Martha? Thank you, Lauren. I may be the most qualified, I'm also the most tired uh, because we finished arguing the gay marriage case before the Court of Appeal last week. So you'll forgive me if this is uh, rather off the top of my head. Um, there are uh, four subjects generally that I am going to talk to you about in my uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, Walsh and Bona, just in, as an introductory matter. Uh, constructive trust. Uh, and what we should think about in the wake of Walsh and Bona. The presumption of resulting trust and resulting trust generally. And uh, finally, just what the legislative amendments have been at the federal and provincial levels, particularly in favor of same-sex couples, um, and uh, what those implications are for our practices uh, day to day. 
Uh, Lauren is right that um, everybody uh, or many people were predicting that Walsh and Bona was going to go the other way. Um, I uh, probably most loudly was writing in papers and uh, speaking at conferences and telling everyone that uh, uh, the result was assured, uh, which obviously was incorrect. Uh, so you can decide how much you're going to pay attention to anything else I have to say today on that basis. Um, uh, Walsh and Bone, I think most of you know, was about uh, a woman who had lived in a 12-year unmarried relationship. She'd had uh, two children, and uh, she would, uh, was not able to make, for reasons that aren't clear on the record, a good constructive trust claim. Um, and so she claimed equalization of net family property or its equivalent under Nova Scotia legislation. She lost at trial. She was successful before the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal. Uh, and uh, that court basically followed a combination of Miron and Trudel, which was a case about unmarried couples and accident benefits, uh, in which the Supreme Court of Canada said that the marker of marriage was the wrong marker and that we should look at the functional uh, relationship and give uh, benefits accordingly. Uh, and the combination of Miran and M&H and the equality analysis in M&H, which was about access to a court-enforced system of spousal support for gays and lesbians and how denial of that access demeaned the dignity of gays and lesbians, the combination of those two cases uh, made it appear that uh, success would be uh, assured, and that is what the um, Nova Scotia Court of Appeal did. The Supreme Court of Canada uh, heard the case um, last year and released its decision um, in uh, February. Uh, the decision that's in your binder, unfortunately, is from the Court of Appeal uh, and not from the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada version and all Supreme Court of Canada cases uh, are available in full text on the Supreme Court of Canada website, uh, which is available at um, www.lexum.com umontreal.ca, that's you like University of Montreal.ca. And um, the opening page of that has a search uh, box that you can search any Supreme Court of Canada decision, in fact, any word. It's an absolutely amazing site for Supreme Court cases, especially in emergencies. Um, so what the Supreme Court of Canada said in a judgment that was written by Justice Bastarache uh, is uh, that uh, the choice of whether or not to marry is a fundamental freedom and that we should not change people's expectations and uh, the implications of those expectations at law uh, lightly and that uh, we should respect the choices uh, that were made. Now, this runs basically totally contrary to what the Supreme Court said in Miran. In Miran, the Supreme Court said, you can't uh, assume choice because there are particularly many women, especially with children, who don't exercise free choice. But the court said we cannot, uh, we cannot consider that when we're looking at the relationship between the couple. Uh, we don't have to have a big discussion about whether it's right or not. I prefer uh, uh, the decision, the dissent of Madame Justice Laura Dubé. She, uh, I'm sure you're surprised, dissented. Uh, she was the sole dissenter. Um, and um, I think that her judgment is the appropriate substantive equality judgment. It may become a judgment of the majority of the court, uh, but I wouldn't think that we would see that for at least 10 years, maybe more. And maybe, frankly, never. If the law responds appropriately to this so that particularly gays and lesbians have the freedom to choose marriage, and otherwise uh, our, our laws really treat those who are married and unmarried equally, there may be little effect uh, if the gay marriage issue is resolved in an equality-minded way. Um, what, is, what the court said in, in Walsh was that, uh, as opposed to M&H, uh, the assumption that people make free choices that should be respected uh, doesn't attack their dignity. And, of course, dignity is the single... Uh, consideration, notwithstanding there's a 12-part test uh, in equality cases, it, it really all comes down to the dignity interest. And so, uh, and I think all of us can understand that it isn't the same attack to dignity to an unmarried spouse. Um, so, 
it seems that the uh, distinctions that are left in particularly in family law and in succession law between married and unmarried spouses uh, are going to survive charter scrutiny. Now, many of those distinctions were eliminated, uh, particularly in favor of gays and lesbians, but also in favor of straight unmarried couples uh, in the last uh, several years by uh, law reform. Uh, the, in Ontario, it was by what we call shorthand Bill 5, but which was um, in a sheer act of taking legislative responsibility, an act to amend certain statutes because of the Supreme Court of Canada decision in M&H and uh, the federal legislation, uh, uh, Bill C-23. Uh, so then I think that makes us take an, a second look at our constructive trust uh, claims and uh, what we plead uh, in constructive trust cases or in unmarried uh, property cases. Uh, so I think there's two main points there. The first is uh, there's no reason anymore under constructive trust uh, jurisprudence to claim a constructive trust interest only in a piece of property or only in one particular thing. So uh, uh, we see often now claims that are uh, against all of somebody's assets. Um, and secondly, I think it's very important to conceive of constructive trust properly, both in terms of how we plead it uh, and in terms of how we then understand it and argue it. Constructive trust is a remedy for unjust enrichment. So the thing to plead in your pleading is the unjust enrichment. Constructive trust is one of several remedies that's available. But many people, what we see in pleadings a lot is a, a declaration that I have a constructive trust uh, in certain asset uh, in the pleading. Uh, really, the preferable uh, pleading, I suggest, is uh, a declaration that the uh, defendant has been unjustly enriched to the detriment of the plaintiff, and then a declaration in the alternatives of the relief that you want. So all of the property of the defendant is held in trust, uh, by way of constructive trust, or another remedy for unjust enrichment that few people know about, but which clearly exists in equity, uh, is uh, an equitable lien in favor of the plaintiff. That way you can get your money in your, your uh, quantum merit amount uh, without actually getting any piece of property. Often it's not so great to get the piece of property. Um, uh, thirdly, uh, securing any money judgment. Fourthly, a quantum merit amount. Uh, relating to the contributions. Uh, and I, I just have here a draft pleading. So the next thing that I have in my draft is a declaration that the plaintiff has a beneficial interest in the increase in value of all other property of the defendant. Um, and then I think it's more important in these cases than perhaps other cases to remember to ask for your certificate of pending litigation, uh, to remember to ask for preservation orders. Um, because uh, you, nobody likes to win the case and have nothing to secure, to seize. Um, resulting trust, uh, we know about, I think, generally, ever, we all learned about it in law school, but we have largely stopped using it because uh, constructive trust seems to work so well. And. Uh, there is a serious problem with respect to uh, resulting trust uh, with unmarried spouses. Uh, so the general background is that we have, there is a presumption of resulting trust where people take title uh, in the name of one party or both, and uh, uh, there has not been an equal contribution uh, to the property. Uh, so equity presumes a bargain, not a gift. Uh, the opposite is a presumption of gift or uh, older language, the presumption of advancement. Um, and uh, there is no presumption of resulting trust at common law and, and is one of gift between a husband but only a transfer from a husband to a wife. And there are other ones, parent to child, etc. cetera. So uh, Section 14 of the Family Law Act codified uh, the basic uh, presumption of, uh, of gift and said that there will be such a presumption except in the cases of joint ownership. Uh, the result of this is that 
uh, unmarried couples, uh, uh, and sorry, Section 14 of the Family Law Act applies only to married couples. So the result is now that uh, unmarried couples are left out in the cold. And I'll give you a, a live example from by far the worst case I've ever been involved in, uh, a trial uh, that ran for three weeks before uh, Justice Mesber in a case called MacArthur and Zadok, uh, which is a reported decision in which I was so fortunate to be counsel. Um, the, uh, the parties were not married, but um, we'll call him husband anyways, just for ease. The husband claimed uh, that um, although the parties took title to a house in joint names, uh, that he had made a greater percentage of the down payment, and that throughout the marriage he had paid for, or their relationship, he had paid for a greater proportion of their household expenses. And so uh, they should not be uh, presumed to hold the property jointly. They should hold the property 90% in favor of him and 10% in favor of her. And they were both lawyers. Uh, they're both quite infamous uh, criminal lawyers, but that's just gossip. Um, and they, uh, he had held title to other properties in the past, and um, he said, notwithstanding uh, that he knew what it meant to hold title jointly, that this was the state of the law, and he was right, it was and is. Um, and so the trial ran for three weeks in which uh, he had a, a sheet, an Excel spreadsheet, that was 76 pages long of every payment he made during the whole relationship that included dog walking, uh, spaying the dog, and uh, virtually every other expense you can imagine. Uh, uh, we countered, I acted for the um, uh, female spouse, uh, we countered uh, by saying, uh, well, there were all these renovations and she paid for all kinds of renovations and she uh, also, um, oversaw all the renovations that improved the property, et cetera. Anyway, the thing was an evidentiary nightmare uh, with each day w that went on, particularly each day uh, in which the council's estimates of the amount of trial were like doubled and tripled. Justice Mesber became more and more impatient. And um, in the end, she said, of course, well, he knew uh, what it meant to take title and joint names. And uh, anyways, she gave pretty good evidence that she'd equally contributed in other ways, so it's just a wash and they're, they're joint owners. Uh, but there is a serious mess in the fact that Section 14 does not include unmarried spouses. And it is something that I think might be vulnerable to constitutional challenge, but I'm not sure how you could ever dance around um, uh, Walsh and Bona now from the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind. Um, the other argument that you can make about the um, presumption is uh, that the common law is supposed to evolve in accordance with charter values. Uh, that starts with Dolphin Delivery, uh, a very early uh, charter case, um, and there are all kinds of cases about how even in private relationships judges should evaluate the law in accordance with charter values. So before Walsh and Bonin, you could really say that because then you could say, well, Miran says we're supposed to treat unmarried opposite and same-sex couples the same. And it's a, maybe slightly harder to, to make the charter values argument, uh, but it is available to be argued. And I think it is uh, appropriate when we're talking about uh, section uh, 14, because if we looked at section 14 again in light of uh, our views about married and unmarried couples, the extent to which married and unmarried couples are treated the same across all legislation. Uh, I think that uh, if anybody took a look at this again in a proactive legislative way, um, that there might be, uh, we might have included section 14 or that there might be an inclination to do that now. Uh, the last thing that I was gonna talk to you about was just the sort of basic overview about um, uh, what changes uh, have been made uh, to the law, uh, and particularly in favor of um, uh, same-sex couples. And so the basic, just to, to give you the summary for uh, matrimonial lawyers generally. Uh, so in Ontario, um, the, the legislation is called amendments because of the Supreme Court of Canada decision in M&H. It's now October 99, so we're supposed to know these things. Um, but it includes land transfer tax, which is the thing I probably get the single most uh, questions about than anything else. So uh, 
straight couples and, and uh, gay couples who are unmarried can make transfers pursuant to separation agreements uh, free from having to pay land transfer tax. Um, there ha at the federal level, uh, there have been uh, wholesale tax changes in favor of unmarried opposite and same-sex couples. And um, the summary, that comes from Bill C-23, and the summary of those is joint tax filing, spousal rollovers, principal residence exemptions, uh, deductibility of spousal support, uh, and the GST credit. Now there's one that I haven't said, and it's the one that I think most of us don't know or most of us forget about, and that is uh, that all unmarried couples, straight or gay, are entitled to Division of Canada Pension Plan credits that have accrued during the currency of their relationship. Same with unmarried, or same with married couples, you can't contract out of that provision. So uh, even if you've forgotten about it in some of your other cases, you could still call your clients and tell them they can apply at any time. Um, you um, you ha have to. Um, you have to have cohabited for one year. Uh, and again, it's an opposite sex or same sex relationship. The credits get transferred. I think most people know how they work because we do them with married couples too. The credits just get transferred into other spouse's name and there's no benefit felt until the CPP actually gets it into pay. Uh, so I think those are uh, the that's the basic overview. Um, I, uh, I told a Andrew I'm not going to answer uh, any other questions. Uh, the most obvious questions like, are you gay? Um, uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the good answer to that question. Uh, but the best answer is probably, you know, I was thinking of it, but Andrew Friedman changed my mind. <laughs> Uh, in case anyone's keeping score, uh, uh, Martha's theme in today's, uh, today's program was how to serve the pie with proper etiquette. Uh, with s having said that, we'll now take questions from our virtual audience. Barry, do you have any questions for Martha? Branford, do you have any questions? Oh. Hamilton, are there any well. questions? <laughs> Kenora, do you have any questions? <laughs> Kingston, any questions? <laughs> Kirkland Lake? <laughs> London, Ontario, any questions? <laughs> Niagara on the Lake, any questions? <laughs> North Bay? <laughs> Any questions? One question. Ottawa? There has to be a question from Ottawa. Peterborough, any questions? Sault Ste. Marie? No. Sault Ste. Marie, you're batting a thousand if you ask a question. <laughs> Sudbury, any questions? Thunder Bay? Waterloo? To and Windsor, any questions? Thank you. We'll now take a question from Toronto. Martha, there's a series of cases in Ontario, which I'm sure you're more than familiar with, which say that there is no sharing of pension benefits, employer pensions, particularly TTC, was dealt with recently, um, with common law couples. And um, you expressed um, some feeling that you felt would be successful if you could say that there was a resulting trust, um, which wouldn't work. But then you said that uh, maybe we can go and we can say that there's uh, some equity in sharing that. It's always been my position, and I've never had this tested yet at a trial, that if there's a 20 plus year common law relationship, and they obviously that puts them into their late 50s, early 60s, that it's going to be pretty darn hard not to succeed in a case such as that for a common law couple that there's a sharing of a pension, particularly when they're as large as a uh, TTC pension, when the gentleman is, and I just say that as, uh, 
usually the case worked you know, in the wheel factory or whatever, the TTC, for 40 odd years. Do you feel that I'm correct that it's always worth a shot at it, regardless of the current case law? Yes, I agree. I agree completely with that. I think that there is a case uh, out of BC um, in which uh, the only asset that was really there to be subject to the constructive trust claim was a very uh, rich pension that was in pay and uh, that the pension was divided, you know, a, a trust was found and divided in, on the basis of the, uh, the division of the income, so to speak. But what we see a lot in unmarried uh, cases uh, of significant duration is, of course, that, that the pension is one of the biggest assets. And uh, I don't think that our old view of constructive trust, which was that it's really about a house and whether there's a connection between the contribution and the house and that whole thing, applies anymore. And uh, I, certainly that's one of the reasons why I say you should make a trust claim over all the assets. Uh, and particularly over the pension. And especially, you know, the evolution of these cases, uh, they always build one on top of the other. But now that we have Walsh and Bona uh, that says that unmarried opposite sex couples can be treated differently, I think courts are going to be more willing to look at the injustice. Uh, we know that they consider generally that uh, there has been unjust enrichment in, in long-term relationships. And if that means that the only asset left is a pension, I think uh, the law has to evolve uh, in a way that lets you get at that pension. Uh, Martha, I have a question for you. You've just touched on it in the answer to your last question. My question is, is there a distinction that you see in the case law between how the courts deal with constructive trust claims as between uh, married partners in one situation, common law partners in a second situation, or same-sex partners in the third situation. So I guess what I'm saying is, if, if one looks at the case law, um, is, is the law applied differently in those three situations? And secondly, do you foresee a change in the future as to how the court will apply constructive trust in each of those three situations? I can't think of any cases that I could like throw out that would be some brilliant answer to that question. But um, I think that, of course, when we have equalization available in the large part to married couples, uh, then the tough uh, constructive trust cases are usually about the unmarried uh, situations. And um, I think what we do see for sure in the case law, uh, or what I think most of us assume when we're uh, bargaining in the shadow of the law and settling, as we do most of our cases, is that constructive trust that results in half interest in all the assets is pretty much assumed entitlement in uh, long-term unmarried relation, straight relationships anyhow. And if it's a very long-term gay relationship, I think uh, most of us and that courts are going to be uh, very interested in, in doing what looks like justice. And yes, I think the law really is going to develop in a different way now that we have this definitive statement uh, that says that there are consequences for married and unmarried couples on the basis of the choice they made uh, as to the form of their relationship. And so without the option to do a challenge, um, I think that courts are going to have to become more attuned to the equitable arguments. Of course, we know from Rollick, like from way back, uh, that the statutory provisions aren't exclusive and that you always have your equitable rem remedies. And those just become much more important now uh, for unmarried couples uh, following Walsh and Bona. Any other questions? I have one more, just because I think we have another minute or two uh, before we move on. Uh, Martha, has there been any response from the Ontario provincial government um, to suggest that there might be a legislative response to Walsh and Bona. Uh, and I guess looking forward to the next election, have any of the political parties taken any position on this issue? No, there's been no response, and I think there's no indication I, I, that there will be a response. Uh, the person who won uh, Walsh and Bona uh, is uh, 
uh, Sarah Kreischer, who uh, many of us know is the wife of Danny Malamed, uh, who's a matrimonial lawyer. And uh, she was the government lawyer for the Attorney General of Ontario. And uh, if you uh, are a loser with little else to do like me and you watch the tape of the argument of the Supreme Court of Canada in Walsh and Bona, what you see is that Sarah Kreischer completely carried the day. The argument that she made was, you can't assume, given the myriad of unmarried relationships, the very differences in purposes, reasons for being unmarried, roles and responsibilities, all of the different models that there are, you can't impose on that a presumption of equalization. It's not fair, it doesn't fit. And uh, I think that the Ontario government feels very uh, uh, vindicated. They sort of swept in and saved Nova Scotia. And, um, and I, so I don't think that there, uh, there will be uh, legislative reform. I don't. Uh, thank you very much. Our next speakers are Lauren and myself, and we're just going to um, renovate the, uh, the uh, podium here. We're doing this in tag team. Uh, our topic is uh, how to um, basically split up the pie, how to serve it, how to take it out of the pan. Uh, we are going to talk about um, four case studies that are in your papers in tab six. If you go right to the uh, last four pages, we are going to uh, present the topics, bless you, we're going to present the topics um, that are contained there in a, a little bit of a tag team presentation. So why don't you sit over there and I'll sit here. Here, here, take this. I think that works. Okay, that's fine. We'll just pass it between us. Oh, you got one? Okay, great. Okay, I, hope, hopefully uh, the people who do these things can uh, adjust the cameras. Uh, if not, then you'll hear me and you won't see us. Okay, great. If you could turn first to page 620-25 of your materials, I'm going to lead off for the first uh, case study. And uh, then we're going to try to move fairly quickly because we have four case studies and we have 30 minutes. And we'll try to allow a few, uh, a few moments for uh, questions. The first one is the typical family trust situation. Bob has a dental practice. In 87, he set up a management company to manage his practice, which in turn was owned by a family trust. Bob's father was the settler of the trust. Bob and his accountant are the trustees. Bob's three children are the beneficiaries. Bob has always used the trust as a method of splitting income with the kids. At the date of the separation, the management company owned the lease, leasehold improvements, equipment, Bob's Lexus, uh, and his valuable art collection. Uh, this is a case that Patch and I actually have together on right now. All the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Uh, so question number one. Bob's taken the position that the value of the management company and the family trust should be excluded from his NFP because he has no beneficial interest in either. Wife says that the equity in the company should be treated as if they belong to Bob. How would a court resolve the issue? Well, a strict reading of the Family Law Act would say, uh, what property does Bob have in this situation? And the answer appears to be none. Even though he's a trustee, uh, he's not a beneficiary, and it's really a beneficial interest uh, in property that would uh, get you into a situation where there's an asset that you could uh, uh, include in that family property. But all is not lost. Um, wife can make an argument that because Bob effectively has controlled the trust and controlled the management company, that the court should treat uh, him as if he owned it. Now that seems a bit of a stretch, but I actually found a case uh, that says that. It's an old decision called Crutchfield, C-R-U-T-C-H-F-I-E-L-D. It's from 1987, back in the early days of the Family Law Act, Ontario High Court of Justice, where the court basically said no reasonable person would separate the practice from the assets of the company in determining the value of the property. Neither the wife nor the husband would attempt to sell them separately on any rational basis. So what the court basically did in that situation is they said, we're going to treat it as if it's husband's asset, and whoever has the shares, in that case the wife did, wife, you've got to transfer those shares back to husband. Now, that may surprise some of you who look at a strict family law analysis. Others of you who say, yeah, that makes sense. Put that in your pocket for the next time you're acting for a wife in that situation and you want to get the trust or the management company that really seems to belong to the kids into onto husband's net family property. 
Um, key to this situation is looking at the history. What's the history of the trust? Has husband treated the asset as his own? Um, and did, it, uh, did he use the money? And you can even argue if, in fact, for tax purposes, he would have to flow the funds through to the kids. Typically, it would have paid for family expenses, and wife will argue, well, husband, it relieved you of the obligation of supporting your kids and family. You used that money as if it was your own, and that's the control that uh, we're looking for. So th those are the arguments that I think you want to uh, look at in that situation. Um, Andrew, do you want to add anything to that? I, I would say that when you're looking at these, these trust cases, you have to look at the actions of the trustees. Uh, certainly, if you have an irrevocable trust, in this case you do, uh, clearly the ownership is of the shares of the management company is with the children as beneficiaries, but if the husband, if the trustees uh, have made disbursements on, to the benefit of the husband, then you may make an argument that, that uh, the husband is in, really in control and that that would be probably a good argument to say that it's his property. The Crutchfield case that uh, Lauren brought up has a little bit of a twist and in that case it was, it was a dentist who owned a practice and a management company and the argument was that you can't distinguish uh, the value because you have different owners. Uh, and in that case, he, I believe he was the owner of the management company and what the court did was to combine the income and expenses of both, both businesses into one and valuing it together. In this case, you have a cl clearly have a separate owner, separate from the dental practitioner, which makes this a little more difficult to, uh, uh, to distinguish in that case. Um, the valuation of the trust interest becomes a fascinating exercise. What is the value of, of, a, of a discretionary interest uh, in, a, in, in this kind of trust where the ability to draw out capitals at the discretion of the trustees? Uh, in my view, the value is nil. However, the court has taken uh, different views and uh, Lauren and I were fortunate enough to, to be together on the losing side, losing, I'm not sure if you use that word, but on, on the Sagal decision where the judge basically took the trust, added up the value and divided it by the number of trustees and said, Mr. Sagal, that's your share. Um, there's been some discussion as to whether or not that's the right way to do it, but that's the way they do it in Ontario. I have real problems with that. Um, Lauren, maybe you want to talk about that a little more? Sure. That's basically the next question. Would the result in question one have been different if Bob was also a beneficiary? If Bob is a beneficiary, then wife's argument is much stronger because he, number one, has an asset, and that's the beneficial interest in the trust, and then it simply becomes a matter of valuing that asset. Um, and that's the Sagal case. And as, uh, frankly, Andrew, I always thought I won Sagal. I didn't realize till this morning you thought we <laughs> lost. Um, briefly, Mr. Sagal uh, owned a, a company. It was a very relatively short marriage. And what happened was the judge accepted my compromise argument that you should take the value of the underlying assets, totally discretionary trust, no history of any payments out. But what's key in that case is the husband was a trustee and he controlled the trustees. Trustees would always be his buddies. It was clear that the trustees would always act the way he wanted. So with that fact involved, he was only one of, say, six contingent beneficiaries on date of marriage. So what she did is she took the value of the company divided by six. That was the the value of his interest in the company coming into the marriage, but 15 years later, 10 years later, on date of separation, there were all the children and grandchildren, there were 20 beneficiaries, so although the company had gone up in value, you were dividing it by a bigger number, so Mr. Sagal's interest in the trust actually went down from date of marriage to valuation date, so wife ended up owing him an equalization payment. I thought that was a tremendous win for me. Uh, unfortunately, on the last page of her judgment, uh, um, Justice McDonald gave the wife a, a $2 million lump sum award as compensatory support, which undid the big win I got in the first 39 pages of the judgment. But the point
point is, you've got to look carefully at the trust to see what it is. Who are the beneficiaries? Who are the trustees? And if you have a Sagal-like situation where husband controls the trust, then wife is in a much stronger argument to say, you can simply use your trust power to uh, give the assets to yourself. And there's support for that in the Family Law Act. Go back and look at the definition of property in the Family Law Act. You probably haven't looked at it for 15 years. It says property includes assets over which you have a power of appointment. Remember your trust law? A power of appointment is exactly what you have when a husband is a trustee and he's one of a number of contingent beneficiaries. So then wife is in a much stronger position to say that's property, but then you get to the valuation question. Third situation, would the result in question one have been different if the beneficiaries were Bob, Belinda, and the children, and if Bob was not a trustee? If Bob's not a trustee, then wife can't make the argument that you're in control and that you can then give it to yourself, which is the Sagal situation, so she loses that argument. Um, and by making the beneficiaries Bob and Belinda, Bob can always say, well, if my beneficial interest has value, yours should be the same. So if the court's going to say mine is worth X dollars, then why should yours be any different, particularly if I don't control the trusts? We haven't had that case yet, but I think that argument has a certain amount of logic to it. Now, Andrew said that the Sagal decision has been criticized. For those of you who are on the husband side of the argument, or either side, you want to argue against Sagal, there's, a, there's an interesting article that Wolf Goodman wrote. It's in Money and Family Law, I think, six months after Sagal came out, and you can track it down, I'm sure, or call me if you're looking for it, in which he said, and everybody knows Wolf Goodman is the dean of uh, trusts and estates in uh, Ontario, he said the Sagal decision was the stupidest decision he's ever read in his life, and gives lots of reasons why it can't possibly write. Unfortunately, nobody appealed. They all ran out of money. Everybody went bankrupt, so uh, we never had a chance to uh, appeal it. Finally, number four. As a result of a lengthy mediation, Bob has agreed to include the value of the company and the trust in his NFP, provided that the underlying assets can be transferred into his name. Can that be done, and if so, at what cost? Um, in the case I have with Pat, that's exactly what we've agreed to do. We've decided to bury the hatchet. The kids who are the beneficiaries of the trust are all over 18, so they're prepared to sign off. They'd like their parents to stop fighting, and they say, fine, we don't, want, we don't care about this. We'll sign anything you want. The question is, how do you do it? Um, for sure, the children need independent legal advice. If there are uh, contingent beneficiaries not yet born, you've got to get the uh, children's lawyer involved, and that adds a layer of complication to consent on their behalf. Even if you can get everybody who exists to sign off and everybody who doesn't exist to sign off, you've got some serious tax issues. There are some capital gains taxes, and uh, rather than try to do it in 30 seconds, I'll just direct you to a great paper that Martin Roshwig wrote. It was a March 30th, 2001 Law Society conference. He's at Goodman and Carr. It's called Trust Planning and Income Splitting, Unwinding the Family Tax Plan. So if you're interested in the tax issues or how do you unwind a family trust, which today has become a major issue, I get lots of these cases, maybe you do, that's where you'll want to look to see how do you do it. And sometimes that's the best compromise rather than arguing the legal issues. Let's, let's put it where it should be. Obviously, the, the company and the asset should be owned by the dental practitioner, and then let's try to, try to resolve it on a compromise basis. Andrew, any other comments? Uh, one question I had for Lauren when we were t discussing this case was, assuming that the husband is, is not uh, a beneficiary, uh, how, how, in the calculation of his income for guideline purposes, how would you treat the management company's residual pre-tax profit? Is it available to him in the calculation uh, of his income for child support? I would clearly say if husband has in the past utilized the money, which is, is in, in my particular case, then it should be imputed to him. If he's had access to it, if he's used it, it should be treated as his. And I hope that uh, uh, Andrew's partner, Paula White, who we retained to come up with an opinion on that issue, agrees with me. If you could just turn to the next um, case study on page 26. This is a commonly occurring instance when we, are, when we are settling property issues, and that is in the transferring of the matrimonial home, which for the most part should be a very simple and straightforward exercise. For income tax purposes, the ma matrimonial home is generally considered to be equivalent to a principal residence. When you sell your principal residence at a profit, that profit is exempt from income tax if you are able to designate it as your principal residence for 
a, a period of time equal to the number of years that you've owned it. Where the complication comes in is where you have two matrimonial homes, and you can actually have uh, two, it's very, it's very common to see two, and in this case we have a cottage and a city residence. Uh, each party, uh, Bill Bungalow owns half and his wife June also owns half of each property. How do you deal with that in the separation agreement to ensure, as we want to in this case, that uh, Bill will only or will relinquish his entitlement to a principal residence designation? Uh, there are only, there is only one gain that is exempt per family. So if these people were married and they sold both properties, the income tax on one of the gains would be included in one party's income because you're only allowed one per family. What has to happen here in the separation agreement is to, first of all, determine which property or which party will receive the exemption and on which particular home. In this case, Bill has agreed to relinquish his entitlement on, on the uh, city residence to June. And what happens is that if he didn't do that, and Bill sold the cottage first and claimed it as his principal residence, then when June went to sell the city home, she would be excluded or precluded from claiming the exemption on, the principal, on her principal residence because while they were married, only one is entitled. And because Bill jumped in and took it first, she's not allowed to do it. So what has to happen is, first of all, you agree on who's going to uh, be entitled, and secondly, you need to designate which years and on which property um, will be the principal residence of a particular owner, and you must do it in the separation agreement. And on page three, there's a precedent that uh, tells you how to do that, and essentially what you're going to do here is Bill will agree not to designate the home that he had, or the half interest in the home that he had while the parties were married up until the year the agreement is signed. So that when June sells her house, if she should, at some future date, the complete gain on the sale of that property will accrue to her, uh, and, and the, the exemption of that gain will completely accrue to her and not be impeded by Bill's actions. And what you've got here in the case is essentially what I've basically said, and I've shown you how it works. I don't want to get into the arithmetic because it's, it's kind of complicated, but you can see that if you didn't do anything and Bill were to sell the cottage first or June were to sell her home first, then the other party would not be entitled to the exemption and then could have a problem because you may have told Bill that he would be entitled and you may have told June that she was entitled and only one gets it. So be careful when you're drafting these agreements when you have two uh, matrimonial homes. Uh, the only comment I would ask, add is, again, to make it very clear in the agreement so neither party can come back down the road. Uh, it may be clear at the time, and if you don't build it into the agreement, someone may have a surprise and come back and sue you. And I've also heard of cases where the parties agree, and because you don't file the principal residence exemption until the first person to sell a property, which could be many years later, sometimes people act not in, in accordance with their agreement. So let's, let's say the parties agreed that uh, one spouse would get the principal residence exemption, the other one didn't, but the one who doesn't get it uh, sells their property first, claims the principal residence exemption, the other person isn't around so doesn't know it, and I, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, is that Revenue Canada sort of gives the prize to the person who acts first. And typically, people don't file these things until the property happens. Now, a well-drafted separation agreement will say, well, if Bill acts contrary to the terms of this agreement, he's going to indemnify June for any tax or loss or blah, blah, blah. But who knows? Bill may be a scoundrel, and he may be gone. And uh, many years later, June gets a surprise when she doesn't, she doesn't find out until she sells her property 25 years down the road. And by then, uh, Bill's been living in Australia for 20 years, and he's well beyond our borders. So of course. Uh, June has nothing else to do but turn around and sue you. So um, be very careful uh, about it. It's not enough just to have the designation and have it signed. I think
think you've got to advise your clients in terms of the risk. Uh, I don't know if there is provision, maybe Andrew knows, for filing it now, even though filing with Revenue Canada today, even though nobody's selling anything for many years, that would be the answer if it existed, but I don't know if it does. The tax department will uh, not look at the agreement for a resolution of this problem. Whoever sells first will get the, will get the exemption, it's clear. They don't really uh, care to get into a dispute. Uh, whoever sells first will get the exemption. What you should do is, is prepare the desi de designation and include it with the uh, separation agreement, with the written agreement, and then um, uh, you, you know, you've got it on writing. And probably uh, it would not be a bad idea to send it in with your tax return. I mean, it, it doesn't really relate to anything. You really don't have to file that form until you have a sale and only when a portion of the sale is included in your income. I mean, all of you have sold homes. You've never included uh, a principal designation uh, a claim in your tax return because of the, the complete gain is exempt. It's only when a portion of the gain is not exempt that you must include the form. So why not fill it in and send it in anyways just to protect yourself? Even though it relates to nothing, I would suggest that you do it. Great. Let's move on to uh, case study number three. They're a little bit out of order. That's found on uh, page 6-28. Uh, this is the uh, typical problem that you have. Uh, uh, the mechanics, when sometimes the mechanics are the things that bedevil us. Sam owns a small manufacturing company on his 69K. He's, he's shown his interest in the company, basically puts down book value. He says the company has no commercial goodwill. Uh, wife thinks otherwise. She remembers Sam bragging to his friends a few years ago at a barbecue that he could sell the company for $2 million. Uh, the, the always remember, don't brag to your spouse about how much your company is worth because it can come back to haunt you. And typically, uh, it was never true at the time, and uh, it may turn out to be evidence. In any event, uh, wife's lawyer says that husband has an obligation to go out and get a proper valuation by a qualified business valuator. Husband's lawyer says, no, he doesn't have to do that. All he has to do is put down a number. He's put down a number. It's up to Susie to go out and hire a valuator. Who's right? Um, I don't think the law is clear. The only case I'm aware of, there was a decision of Master Cork, for those of you who are old like me and remember the days we had family law masters, and there's a case of his that basically said, agreed with husband's position. All you have to do is put a number down and you have to give a basis for it and that's all the act really requires. I've had this debate with many people. I'm not aware of any more recent or better authority. If you know of one, let me know in your, in your comments. But, but, but I think the practical answer is that if husband takes that position, which might be right in law, it's probably a stupid position to take tactically because he loses a little bit of control over the process. And what will then happen is Susie will hire her uh, evaluator. Susie will say, well, I don't have any money, so I'm going to bring a motion for interim disbursements. The judge is going to be sympathetic to her because husband has, looks unreasonable in not going out and get evaluation. It's going to cost twice as much for her to do her evaluation because she's got to ask for all the documents. Her evaluator is starting from scratch as opposed to just critiquing the valuation that husband's evaluator could have done at significant cost. So it'll probably backfire and what will happen is a judge will give Susie whatever she wants in terms of an order for disclosure, will give her whatever she wants in terms of uh, interim disbursements and she'll get a much larger number than she probably would. So it, it's probably a bad tactical position to take. Now, how should Sam's lawyer respond to the motion for interim disbursements? If there's going to be an equalization payment owed in any event, he'd probably be smart by giving her an advance on the equalization. Because better to do it that way and at least get credit for the money you're giving as opposed to interim disbursements for which you get absolutely no credit. Uh, now, occasionally judges will make an interim disbursement order and say, by the way, husband can claim credit for this in the equalization, but they don't always do that. And if you're not alert, sometimes you'll find out that there was an order and it's not clear whether husband gets credit for that at all down the road. So um, be, be cautious with that. Number three, I'm moving quickly because we're running out of time. Susie's evaluator has submitted a lengthy list of information and documentation. All of the CBVs in town have these on their word processor and they press one little button and there's a list of 5,000 documents they want. Husband has refused to produce the material, uh, not on the ground that it's none of your business, but on the ground that it would be damaging to the business if it's produced because it's uh, very 
competitive business and if my competitors find out about it, blah, blah, blah. And he says, by the way, Susie always threatened to leak this information to my competitor to destroy me and that's why I shouldn't have to produce it. What would a court do? A court would probably say, if it's relevant, if it's reasonable, it's got to be produced. They would remind Susie and her lawyer and evaluator that there's an implied undertaking under the rules that information and documentation can only be used for the purpose of this litigation. But if Sam wants a little more protection, they would probably order Susie, her lawyer, and her evaluator to sign a, a confidentiality agreement to make it very explicit in terms of what they can and can't do with the documentation. And I've given you a little precedent from a recent case of mine that's a tab 6-31 uh, of a sample confidentiality agreement. And there's no magic to it. You can do your own, but uh, this may save you a little bit of time. Last point number four, in order to save costs, Susie's lawyer has proposed that the parties jointly retain one business evaluator to appraise the business. What are the pros and cons? I like joint retainers. Uh, I use them a lot uh, with business evaluators, and I believe that in the right case with the right people involved, you can save time, you can save money, you can focus on the issues quite quickly, and uh, very often you can get negotiated resolutions because each of the parties feel involved in the process, and it's sort of like uh, a cussy access assessment report. Rarely does anybody go to trial because you're going to say, well, if that's what the, j the jointly retained business evaluator thinks the business is worth, why is the judge going to do anything else? So nine times out of ten parties will agree to accept it, and that's the end of that issue of the case. The problem is, if the parties are fighting like cats and dogs and they can't agree on anything, odds are you're going to have di difficulty getting them to agree on the scope of the valuation. The person who's the titled party is going to want to keep it narrow and is going to want to keep it um, de minimis, can keep costs down. The person who's on the outside is going to want to have a huge inquiry, look at, turn over every rock, look at every piece of paper, and is going to want to do more even though the cost is going to be shared. So it's, qu it's quite easy for these things to get out of control unless you have a really good business evaluator who knows how to control the parties and you don't have crazy people. If you have crazy people, it's just going to unwind Wish and you you'd, you'd be better off litigating it and doing it in some other fashion. The problem is in Toronto, you never get to trial and in a case conference or pretrial conference, the judge is going to probably say, well, let's bring Andrew Friedman over here. He's going to look at all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. So you end up doing the same thing, but at least sometimes is good for the court to control the process and that's where when people get unreasonable the judge can say enough is enough Andrew what do you think sometimes that works I think that if you're going to consider uh, jointly retaining somebody you should impose upon the parties or get them to agree that the joint valuators decision is binding on both of them otherwise it really uh, in, in some cases where the parties are really fighting it doesn't make sense Certainly the pros are that it saves money, the con is that it costs more, the pro is that it's faster, the con is that it takes longer. It really depends on the parties and if you have it binding and if you let the uh, joint valuator really call the shots in terms of what's appropriate disclosure, how the report and findings are going to be delivered and when and how much time you have to respond, etc., let him control it, then it'll work. If not, it doesn't. Moving on to our last case, a study on page 29. Uh, this deals with financing the equalization payment, and this is a tried and true uh, method of, a, of, a, of a, an example of how to uh, fund a $500,000 equalization payment uh, that Tom owes his separated spouse, Nicole, where the money, where he has the money, but unfortunately it's not in his bank account, it's in a bank account owned by a company that he owns. How do we get the $500,000 out of his company to Nicole without any income tax imposed on any of the procedures? It can be done, I've done it many times, uh, and I've shown this to people before, and it's certainly worth looking at again. And what I've done for you as well is prepared a little slide which we'll now put on the screen that will take you through the steps that are described and listed uh, in, uh, on page 29. What we have here is essentially a corporate setup where Tom, before we drew the diagram, owned shares in Holdco number one. Holdco number one has $500,000 in it. He then incorporates Holdco number two, and when he does that, he transfers, pursuant to the written agreement, one share to Nicole. 
So now Nicole and Tom are shareholders in Holco number one. Sorry, Nicole owns, he transfers shares in Holco number one to Nicole. She's a shareholder with Tom. Tom takes his shares and puts them into Holdco number two. So what you have then is essentially what you see on the screen, where Tom owns Holdco number two, which is the sole shareholder of Holdco number one. What happens next is we start to move the money. The $500,000 is paid as an intercorporate dividend from Holdco number one to Holdco number two so that we can move the $500,000 from one to two on a completely tax-free basis because dividends between companies, private companies that are owned by the same shareholder essentially, can be moved without incurring any income tax. Nicole will then take her share of Holco number one and transfer it to her holding company called Nicole Co. So now, instead of having owning the share personally, she owns, it in her, uh, she owns it in her holding company. What happens next, and the last step in the plan, is that hold call number two, which now owns, now has the $200,000, will purchase Nicole Co's one share from that company for $500,000 so that the funds now move from Holdco number two to Nicolco, $500,000 moves across, and that will be considered a dividend between companies. And because it's an intercorporate dividend between companies that are controlled by uh, arm's length parties, the dividend received by Nicolco is received on a tax deferred basis. So we have now moved $500,000 from Holco one to two and then over to Nicole Co's company. Nicole Co then relinquishes uh, the share that she owns, so you have complete separation, as we show you here in the next slide. Um, and the money is inside her holding company. The thing to remember, though, is that the money is inside her holding company. If she were to withdraw the money out, then she will have to pay tax on it. However, in the right set of circumstances, this, case, this type of settlement scenario is appropriate because if Nicole Co has sufficient resources, um, uh, does not have significant debt, then she can afford to leave the money inside Nicole Co, invest it how she sees fit. She can draw out the investment income on an annual basis and, of course, pay tax on it, but the half a million dollars of capital will be preserved inside the company, and she won't pay tax on it until she dies. So there's a significant deferral there, and the value of that liability, depending on the age of Nicolco, would be uh, a very small. So this, is a, th this plan works. Uh, we've done it before, and it is, is a very uh, elegant and neat solution that doesn't cost too much from a, a legal point of view uh, to implement. Uh, we're now finished with the slide. Thank you. Just add one comment to that. I have a case uh, in Ottawa where the equalize husband owned a software company and the equalization was in many millions of dollars. And what we did was husband needed time to pay, couldn't fund it immediately, so we're spreading it over eight or nine years. So we used a combination of Andrew's Butterfly, which was designed to get a big chunk of the money over into wife's company to get rid of the cost of disposition problem that Andrew's uh, example did. But it was also a way of giving wife security for he, her equalization claim over the eight or nine years that she had to wait for her buyout because she was worried about what if he disappeared and blah, blah, blah. So what happens is the shares got bought back over time. So there is a way to kill a couple of birds uh, with the same stone in terms of, number one, a tax-efficient way of transferring shares over to the non-titled spouse, as well as giving security for payments that are be, to be prepared over a period of time. And uh, so, in, so you can adjust these things uh, as per your situation. In any event, you've been very patient. We're at the end of time. Um, we'll take one question, if there is one. Um, from Toronto. From Toronto. Anybody in Toronto? Looks like everybody's ready to go have lunch. Okay, that's Thank the you case. Very, Thank you all very much for your time and attention. If you could please fill out the um, evaluation forms and those from out of town, just fax them into the phone number that's listed on the form. Thank you.
finished exactly.